at your camera or do you look at the monitor? I go back and forth between the monitor and the camera. Got it. Okay, there we go. So let me share this to Equity Live. Equity Live to see if it's there. Hello, everybody. Give us a second. We're just trying to get situated here. We're trying to save to several different locations um, and want to make sure or share to several different locations and just want to make sure that it gets where it needs to get. Thank you all for tuning in to our conversation with this brilliant woman here this scholar. There it is. Okay, we're good. It's where it needs to be. Hello, Reverend Hello. Dr. Courtney. It's so good to be with you, friend. Yes, thank you so much for saying yes to this invitation to share with us about you and what's happening in your world and your scholarship and your brand new book. Yes. I'm excited. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So listen, uh, there may be some people who don't know who you are. So would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, who is Courtney Pace? Well, that's a loaded question if I ever heard of one. <laughs> um, you know, I, I get asked this kind of thing a lot and I never know what direction to go in. So I'll just tell you a bunch and you can cut me off if I go too long. At, at my base identity, I am a follower of Jesus Christ who's trying to understand how that compels me to enact justice in the world. I'm a mother of two, I'm a wife, I'm a member of an extended family. I'm an executive at a credit union, which has been kind of a fun zigzag in life's journey. Huh. And, and I'm a scholar of social justice movements in American religion. So looking at race, gender, class, ableism, heteronormativity, even neuronormativity, and how, how domination has perpetuated itself through so many systems such that it's everywhere and becomes mm -hmm. invisible. And if we can't identify that form of dominance, it's hard to call it out and begin dismantling it to build something equitable and just. So whether I'm working in historical documents or contemporary pop culture or uh, gender dynamics, I'm always trying to think about how those things come to play. Womanists have given us the language of intersectional scholarship, which to the best of my ability, I try to do, and I'm deeply indebted to Kimberly Crenshaw for giving us that language. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. You just mentioned about the domination that becomes invisible. That's really interesting because I was just talking with someone before I got on the call with you and uh, I'm gonna be doing some anti-racism work for their organization. And the executive director, the CEO is a white woman. And one of the things she was saying was how could I have grown up, she's in her fifties, right? And she said, how could I have spent so much of my life in this system and not seen what it really was? And so, yeah, so that, that makes a lot of sense. How would you res respond to something like that? Well, I, in a way, I live that tension. I grew up in Arlington, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas, Fort Worth. And while I was in a very racially diverse public school, I still have to acknowledge that I grew up with privilege. I was able to opt into the concern for justice, which is evidence of privilege itself. And so, in my work, I've tried to keep open eyes to not just pursue what I meant to see, but to see what's really there. So for instance, if you start looking into civil rights, sexism is very loud and clear. 
heteronormativity, classism, ableism, it's all loud and clear if you allow the sources to unearth those voices that have been suppressed by the historical record. So it takes a certain humility. It takes the willingness to constantly admit you have more to learn. I'm not done learning about this. I'm just right. beginning. And I think one important dynamic of this is academic scholarship teaches you to consider certain kinds of sources more valuable than others, which is in itself perpetuating domination yes. and disregarding the embodied knowledge of people outside of formal institutional education. So for instance, one of the things that I love so much about Prathia Hall, and I know we're getting there, is she talked about her time in the civil rights movement as the best education she ever received. Now she has multiple graduate degrees from Princeton, and yet she's talking about sitting on porches with, she called them wise sages of the South who had learned how to survive in the midst of Jim Crow and how that kind of knowledge and wisdom is passed down through the generations of, of people caring for their children and, and struggling for what they know God meant for them. We have to honor that as valid and legitimate, whether it comes from a book or from someone's porch whether it's in correct English or whether it came out the way the person speaks, it's valid knowledge. And when we center those voices, the whole system turns over and everything we thought was concrete suddenly becomes open to questioning. And it's that commitment to constantly asking why. Well, why is it that way? Does it have to be that way? Who decided? It helps us start to recognize how systems perpetuate themselves and the important work of dismantling them that we have to do and why it's so hard, why it will always be met with resistance. Yeah, well, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, so these, uh, this live stream is sponsored by Equity for Women in the Church. Um, where I'm going live here and also going live in the group Equity for Women in the Church. So I want to know, how did you become concerned about equity for women in the church? I grew up in a very vibrant congregation where I felt like I could flourish however God led until I verbalized my own sense of call. That was when I had been very clearly told I had stepped over the line. And I became concerned for equity for women in the church when I realized how important women had been, not only for myself, but for others in spiritual formation and yet were denied a voice in the leadership and proclamation of the church. So if we're going to say that God works through anybody and anybody can have relationship with God and God's bigger than any human system, then God's bigger than sexism. God's bigger than Baptist polity, God's bigger than your denominational structure. And that's going to require us to see how not, uh, Rosemary Radford Ruther has been so helpful for me in this, not only how we have tolerated other people boxing us in, but how we've actually participated in boxing ourselves in and limiting our imagination for how God could call us and others for limiting what we call that Sunday school teacher. Yes, she was a Sunday school teacher, but she was preaching in there. We have to call that what it is and honor the depth of God's call for her life. Almost all of us, if we ask who first taught you to pray, it's going to be a mom or a grandmother or an aunt. Who taught you to go to church and how to dress and how to get to know the community? Guarantee you it's a woman. And, and that's, that's part of how the church survives and even flourishes. So, so that's how I, I became personally engaged. And then I'm so grateful to those who were patient with me as I was taking my first baby steps into equity to help me see, okay, do you see what you feel about gender? Now let's look at race. Now let's look at class. Now let's look at ableism and, and help me to see how those are all connected and how I cannot just advocate for gender equity. I have to be committed to equity with no caveat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So that, that leads us to talk about talk about your scholarship, right? Um, what kind of scholar are you? Um, what areas uh, are you most interested in? And how do those areas speak to your concerns about equity for, uh, for women in the church? I'm formally trained as a church historian. I did my PhD in Baylor's Department of Religion, specifically in church history. 
I had internal minors in New Testament, sociology, and theology. So I've always been kind of interdisciplinary, but the academy doesn't like you to be too interdisciplinary. It doesn't know what to do with that kind of uninhibited creativity. And I remember when I was talking with the graduate program director, who was then Bill Pitts, about why church history was right for me as opposed to say sociology. I think I gave an example about Dawson's Creek. So I've kind of always been a little weird and different in the way that I think about things in my classrooms. My analogies are all over the board. I try to relate things to pe what people understand, right? Like you may not understand a methodology, but you've tried to go on a date before. And so if I can relate it somehow to those interpersonal dynamics, then people can relate. So all that to say, my research is rooted in history, specifically race and gender, but the kind of writing I most enjoy doing doesn't limit itself just to history. I like being able to think not only with people in the academy, but also folks in the pew. And I'm finding a lot of energy lately around folks that have been hurt in the pew and won't go back, but still very much want to talk about spirituality and its role in their life. Their beliefs haven't changed, but their ability to be their real selves in the church is in danger. So they have created their own safe communities for practicing. And, and a lot of devotional material available for lay people is very spiritually shallow. And I know you've been doing a lot of work to put some better things out there for groups to study. I'm so grateful for your badass women of the Bible. It's fantastic. Um, but I think it's important for people in the academy, especially those committed to justice, to write in a way that anyone interested in what you do can understand what you're saying. Because that's the only way we're going to spread these conversations. And if we really believe what we're saying, empower other people even other people without formal academic training to become creators of this kind of work in their context. Absolutely. Uh, make the theology practical, right? Yes. You've got to do that. It's got to be able to translate from the academy to the pew to the street. And there's a letting go that happens in that, that is hard but necessary. That's dismantling that, that hierarchy within ourselves. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, talk about that a little bit, that letting go piece, the difficulty of that. So I see it most now in cancel culture and all the divisions within a certain ideological polarization. So let's, let's talk about those on the left. That's where I'm most familiar. Well, some of us want to use one language to describe ourselves. Some have a very different idea of what to call ourselves. Some people could work with a candidate who isn't perfect. Some want a perfect candidate or they're all out. Some say, well, okay, I like what you did here, but if you can't stand in solidarity with folks who are trans, then I'm out. And others would say, you've got room to grow, but we agree on this, so let's work together. And all these things are dividing us because we have a theoretical ideal that we're holding up and I'm all for pushing toward the ideal, but we're people are approaching this goal from different places. And if there aren't entry points for people to come in and participate in justice, enacting their own transformation, nobody's gonna move that direction. We have to we have to have open doors if what we're saying is everybody belongs and has value. And that doesn't mean we're done. It doesn't mean that just because what you're doing now feels right to you in five years, you might not see it in a more complex and nuanced way. But my hope is that as we're thinking about the academy versus the folk, that's the, the language I've found most helpful to do it, is we can honor the wisdom in everybody and assume that they have come to their convictions as prayerfully and thoughtfully as we have come to ours, even if that looks different. It may not look like reading yeah. books and writing papers. It may look like talking over a beer at a pub. It may look like Sunday school chit chat, but it's, it's really focused on the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, I was thinking about womanism this week, been having some conversations uh, about that in relationship to, uh, to our new book. And, um, and I was, my niece, told me a story about my grandmother, um, her great-grandmother. And my grandmother was, uh, her, her name is Irie McKinley. 
And she worked for a Head Start program, like all of her adult life. And she was in her 90s, still going to the Head Start, working with the kids. And then one day, the administrators told her that she had to have, uh, all the people that worked with the kids had to have a GED or high school diploma. My grandmother didn't have one, but my grandmother went back to school at 90 to get her high school diploma. And I thought, now that is practical womanism right there, yeah. right? Um, and so I, I, that is, those kinds of examples help us bridge the divide of academy and the folk, right? Because yeah. we have these real lived examples of people who are living out their feminism, their social justice, their womanism in real time. Yeah. Absolutely. We went through something very similar here in Memphis. You know, the National Civil Rights Museum is here. And in the recent past, I'd say within the last 10 years, they had a new policy that everyone who worked there had to have a bachelor's degree. And that was to increase the effectiveness of the educational programs they were doing. But it applied to all employees, even those who work in the gift shop, even those who help clean the facility. And there were some long tenured employees who were no longer eligible to continue their employment. So I, your grandma sounds awesome for going back to get a GED at 90. And that is just yeah. fantastic. And, and it's tough because on the one hand, you, you like the idea of having increased standards because it contributes to enrichment of the community, but it will always push people out and shut doors that should remain open. So you have to be, you have to be careful when you make those kinds of decisions and aware of whether they were intended or not, there are byproducts of what you're doing that's that right. may go against what you're trying to do. That's right, that's right. So, so you know, in, in honor of my grandmother, right, let's talk about uh, this other woman who, who is uh, someone that you're very interested in that many of us uh, look, to, uh, look to as a mentor. Uh, let's talk about your new book. Wonderful. So I brought a copy with me, Freedom, yeah. Faith, The Womanist Vision of Prathia Hall. It came out in 2019 with University of Georgia Press. You can order it through their website or at your favorite book retailer. Uh, but it is the first ever book length investigation of Prathia Hall. You'll see her name mentioned in a growing number of books, which brings me so much joy, but there isn't anything long where you can really dig deep into her life story, what she wrote, how her study in, influenced what she was doing in the pulpit. And I'm so grateful that I was able to bring that story into uh, greater awareness. I learned about her from Tom Hall, who's a homiletician at Emory. And I knew when I did my graduate work, I wanted to do something at the intersection of race and gender. But you know, dissertation projects have to be so narrow um, and in conversation with him, he said, well, you know, you ought to look into Prathia Hall. A lot of people think she coined, I have a dream. So maybe there's something there. I Googled her, this was in 2008, and one blog entry came up and a couple of little one-off homemade web pages, but that's it. So I dug deep into any place I could find her name mentioned to build a bibliography to try to piece together her life story. I looked through every major national newspaper. I went through all of the archives of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I was able to get her social and get her FBI file, some arrest records from local courthouses where she did amazing, pioneering, dangerous work. Um, and so over the, from 2008 until about 2014, I was following every clue I could get to piece together her story. I went to now, let, me, let me stop Go ahead. for a second, Courtney, because there are yeah. probably people who are watching this live that have never heard of Prathia Hall. So who is she? Who was yes. she? Yes, so Prathia Hall grew up in North Philadelphia. Her father uh, started, um, started Mount Sharon Baptist Church in Philadelphia and and yet he had he had trained her about social gospel ministry. She's right by Leon Sullivan's OIC that's doing considerable work with poor and economic mobility. 
and she grew up reading Howard Thurman. And then as she sensed her own call to go south, her father was devastated for what that might mean for her, for the danger she would be living right. in. He died in a tragic accident in 1960, one week before the Greensboro sit-in. And every activist I've talked to has pointed to Greensboro as the final straw for them realizing, I need to go. So she finished college very quickly and just went south, didn't even tell SNCC that she was coming. She soon became the unofficial head of the Southwest Georgia Project of SNCC. They were focused on getting people registered to vote. So they would go door to door getting Black people registered to vote, particularly in counties where Black people were a majority of the population, but not registered to vote. In some cases, there would be less than 1% of the Black population was registered to vote. And so through the movement, she gained quite a reputation as a public speaker. In fact, Martin Luther King called her the one platform speaker I prefer not to follow. They often spoke together at fundraising events all over the country, raising awareness of what was happening in the South and raising funds for SNCC's work. She was, in 1963, the leader of the Selma Project. We, we know about that from 1965, but SNCC had been there for three years at that point. As of 1964, she was coordinating all civil rights efforts in Atlanta. There were a lot of organizations there, and she was the hub that worked them all together. She was in a court case that made national headlines. There's a great article in Time Magazine from 1964 about her case and how it bounced between the courts for jurisdiction. And then after the movement, um, I think she was wrestling with her own call to ministry. It, she's, she's even said she went south to try to run from her call, but we all know how that story goes. Yeah. <laughs> so she goes to seminary. She's already married at this point with two children. She goes to seminary and realizes that her husband was not supportive of her call, even though he had participated in her ordination, supported her going back to seminary. And so while going through a very bad divorce with two young children. She continues to pastor Mount Sharon, which is the church her father founded, raise two kids, and do a PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. And her dissertation is a sequel to Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's Righteous Discontent. So it picks up where Higginbotham leaves off and keeps telling the story, getting us to uh, some of the women like Nanny Helen Burroughs and others who followed. Um, and she, she gained so much notoriety as a preacher. I mean, she's just brilliant. If you Google her name now, you can find audio recordings of her preaching. And I strongly encourage you to hear her yourself. Um, but not only was she doing that, she was also organizing support for Black women seminarians. And if you look at who the major movers and shakers are of Black clergy women in the Northeast, almost every single one of them has a direct tie to her work, either advocacy for scholarships or help with pastoral placement or sharing a pulpit to help her get started. I mean, she was just, it was in her bones. I'm not just making a way for myself. I'm clearing right. the way for whosoever God will call alongside of me. Uh, she worked with the, um, uh, the Children's Defense Fund. She worked with um, National Clergy of uh, National Caucus of Black Clergy to try to organize what was happening between Black denominations, parachurch organizations, and community organizations. And so things like One Church, One Child, Children's Sabbath. I mean, she was organizing all that. And she was so brilliant as a strategist. So she would know, okay, so and so always goes to the PNBC meeting. So I'm going to talk to them there. And then I'm going to go to the NBC and get this person's support. And then I'm going to go to CDF. And Marion Wright Edelman and I are going to pitch this. I mean, she was, she knew, that's what women have always done in church life, right, is they organize people and they found out how to make resources go farther. So she would, she would find where collaborations could maximize the impact of what people were doing and really, she did what you described earlier, bridging the academy and the street, not just what are we doing in the classroom, but what are we preaching and then what are we doing in our community organizations to support the people. Absolutely. Um, so what made you decide to choose? I know your professor suggested it, but 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 why did you choose Pray Their Hall? 
Once I heard about her, I couldn't stop thinking about her. Okay. There was something about her story that magnetically gripped me and I couldn't shake it. I, I learned about her trying to accept her own call in the midst of family resistance, trying to pursue academia in the midst of a divorce, bravely risking her own life for voting rights and, and civil rights of others. And I was just, I had to know more. And once I had seen, it was very difficult to find her preaching, but once I had seen manuscripts and heard tapes, I thought not enough people have heard this because if we really listened, we might be farther along than we are now. And she's so, so well connected to people that we are listening to who were thrilled that someone was doing work on her and have been very supportive of the project. Um, people like Jeremiah Wright, Evelyn Brooks Hickenbotham, uh, Leah Gaskin Fitchu of Blessed Memory. They were incredibly supportive. Many of her colleagues from the movement were eager to talk to me and share their memory. They told me how, even though she was 20 years old at the time, there was just something about her in the pulpit that could mesmerize the room. Uh, the late Congressman John Lewis said, whenever she spoke, everybody hushed because they had to hear what she was going to say. I mean, she even as a as a 20 year old college grad, she people couldn't figure out a word for it. They would say there was just something about her that was profound, and and to see what the kind of impact she was able to to build with that. Uh, you could argue she had a tremendous career, but really she struggled to find job placement, to earn the kind of money she should have for the giftedness she brought to her positions. But she had a lasting legacy of impact. She invested in others. She proclaimed the truth, no matter how large or small the congregation gathered. She was true to who she was. She loved her children and her grandchildren dearly. She supported her sisters in ministry. Uh, she did that work of balancing the very best of scholarship with the very best of prophetic preaching, which is exactly what we're all trying to do now. She was doing it in the 80s before we had language for it. She was doing intersectional work before we had language for it. She was doing womanism before we had language for it. Just, just a brilliant pioneer. Um, and and so I, once I knew about her, I, I couldn't not do it. Yeah, yeah. So... As someone who is not a womanist, right? The book is called Freedom Faith, uh, The Womanist Vision of Pravia Hall, right? So for someone who is not a womanist, uh, what have been some challenges for you in writing this book um, and getting it out into the world or have there been? There have definitely been some challenges. I want to clarify first, the Womanist Vision of Prathia Hall was chosen as a subtitle to honor her vision. Freedom Faith is her vision, and the only way to describe it is womanist. It was not an attempt on my part to claim my work as womanist, because it can't be. Womanism emerges from the experiences of Black women, and I cannot do that work. What I can do is let it inform me and use whatever influence I have to put credit where it's due, which is in the womanist community. So out of Prathia's own adoption of that language to describe her work, I honored that by titling it The Womanist Vision. In the preface, if you notice in the second paragraph, I do put a caveat where I acknowledge I'm white and that limits <laughs> what I can do with this work. So. Some people have critiqued the book as reading as a hagiography. I don't mind that critique because I don't need to go in and do a, a critique of her preaching according to womanist methodology. I cannot do that work. I am thrilled for someone to pick up the mantle and do that, but it can't be me. And now, let's back um, up because you just used a, a phrase that I'm not familiar with. You said hag hagiography? The biography of a saint. So some people read like she can do no, they've said that it reads like she can do no wrong. And as far as I'm concerned, she can't. She did not have any skeletons in the closet. She is 100% who she claimed to be. Um, okay. But if someone wants to go in and critique her sermons the way that academic work tends to do, that needs to be done by a Black woman. I cannot do that. I got it. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I've found support for the work. There were some folks initially who wanted to get to know me, 
before they would trust me with their involvement in the project, that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. It's something precious and worth protecting. So I don't mind spending a year building a friendship for someone to decide if they're okay letting me interview them for this work. Or, you know, I went to SNCC's reunion in 19 or in 2010 and also in 2011. There were some folks who were who were watching me to see is this someone we can trust to talk to because they've been burned by scholars sure. who exploited their generosity and used it to advance themselves without actually being concerned for what SNCC was still doing in those communities. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess if you're doubting whether I could write this book, I would recommend read it and see what you think. If you think there's something that should be done by a black woman and you're a black woman, know that you have 100% of my support to pick that up. I think Prathia would be delighted that so many scholars are engaging her work and finding hope and encouragement and resources for their ministry from what she did. Great, thank you. So as we as we close out, think about the atmosphere that we're in now, right? There's a lot going on. There's multiple pandemics. There is uh, Breonna Taylor's uh, murder, and I'm calling it murder, without any justice, right? Um, giving her, granting her a, what, a $12 million um, civil lawsuit is not justice, right? Um, leave us a word or two about Prathia Hall in light of these current realities, particularly in light of Breonna Taylor's injustice. Prathia Hall was shot at by a police officer who emptied his gun at her feet. She was the first person of color to sue the police for brutality against black civilians in Georgia. It took an all white male jury less than 20 minutes to find him not guilty. Mm. And they were so offended that she showed up in court in a suit with a hat and gloves that they made her remove her hat because they couldn't stand the sight of such a dignified black woman. What happened in Kentucky is disgraceful. There's no other way to describe what happened with Breonna Taylor. But what I think Prathia would do is keep proclaiming our demand for justice. Prathia's entire civil rights journey was in the midst of injustice, perpetuated injustice. Korean theology calls this Han, that suffering at repeated injustice that you have no power over. But we do have agency to keep using our voices. We do have agency to pressure our elected officials. For heaven's sake, she fought so we could vote. And we have agency to show up and vote and to confront relatives and friends and be our authentic selves. I promise you there will be resistance if you do that. Yeah. Not every relationship will survive you being your real self. Thanks. But perhaps that's when your faith will be the most authentic because you will have really stepped into what can only be described as the unknown to pursue what's right. And what Prathia says is, freedom faith is the belief that God meant all people to be free. And that I'm gonna trust God to go down to that courthouse and sign my name. Hmm. And I'm gonna trust God to get me home. So whatever you're feeling led to do to proclaim justice to to make sure that police are supporting communities and not attacking them, to make sure that children have access to healthcare and good education and safe places to live, it will be dangerous. But Freedom Faith says we can trust God to lead us there and we can trust God to bring us home. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Courtney Pace. I appreciate your time and, and really, opening up the life of Prathia Hall to us. Uh, I I'm so you, honored to be here, Dr. Session. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, I wish you peace and joy and so much success. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us for Equity Live. We'll see you at the next one. Bye-bye.